Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So welcome to Communication 504. This is Introduction to Argumentation. And I want to begin our discussion of this very interesting and important topic by focusing first on the structure of public argument. That is, what is the language, the vocabulary that we use to talk about public argument when, when we're doing this as critics or observers of public argument or when we're thinking about our own participation in public discourse and our own engagement in argumentative rhetoric. So the first point we want to make is let's talk about what we call an argument, the starting point, or recognizing the status quo. The status quo, this is a term that refers to the way things are now. It's the present state of things, the current policy, the existing law. So when we engage in public argument, it's usually because there's something going on in the way things are now that we don't quite like and we perceive that it could be mitigated or altered or modified in some way if we engage in argument. That is to say, if we can show through reason giving that the present state of things, the way things are now, could be and should be different. But to do that, we have to first understand what is the status quo. That is, what is the current policy or the existing law? Now, when we engage in argument, we do so first by advancing a proposition. And a proposition in public argument always challenges the status quo which is to say, if we want to change the way things are, we have to suggest what that change ought to be. And it would be obviously a change in the status quo. And so whatever proposition it is, a proposition will always challenge the status quo. And an argument doesn't begin until someone advances a proposition. Think about it this way. Suppose someone said, um, I think the colors, the official athletic colors for the University of New Hampshire ought to be blue and white. Now, of course, that wouldn't uh, create or generate any kind of controversy or argument because indeed already the colors are blue and white. So there wouldn't be any challenge to the status quo. There wouldn't be any need to defend the status quo. There wouldn't be any need to give evidence of why we should change to blue and white because that's what the status quo is. But now suppose someone says, no, let's change the UNH official colors to green and gold. Now, if somebody advanced that proposition, we would clearly then have a challenge to the status quo, the status quo of blue and white, 
And then there would be a controversy. Then there would be a reason to defend the status quo or to give reasons in favor of the proposition of changing the colors to green and gold. So a proposition always challenges the status quo, and that's when argument begins. The argument begins when someone advances a proposition for change, and we would say that that proposition or the proposal is being affirmed. So this leads us into the question of taking sides in a debate, right? So we think about how uh, two sides in a debate, uh, two people who disagree or two political parties uh, focusing on a, a matter of controversy, it helps us to understand which side or which party or which person is on which side in the debate. So let's focus first on what we call the affirmative side. We just talked about a proposition how a proposition must challenge the status quo, and how a proposition or a proposal is affirmed. And that helps us to identify who or which side is the affirmative side. The affirmative side in a debate always affirms the proposition, which is to say the affirmative side challenges the status quo. The affirmative side then actually starts the argument because until someone actually challenges the status quo, there is no controversy. There's no reason or point of debating because nobody has said, well, I don't like the colors. We should change them to green and gold, right? So until someone makes that challenge, there is no controversy. So we say the affirmative side starts the argument. And why? Because the affirmative side is the side that has proposed a change in the status quo. On the other side, we have the negative. The negative side denies the proposition. Now, this is a little bit tricky, but let's be precise about this. The negative side is not necessarily defending the status quo, although usually that's what happens. Okay? But the key thing is we, we identify or define the negative in relation to the proposition, not in relation to the status quo. So if someone advances or affirms a proposition, and then we ask, are we, do we agree with the uh, affirmative proposition or do we disagree? If we disagree or we would deny the proposition, we are in the negative. Now, usually that also puts us in the position of defending the status quo. But the key thing here is that the negative side is, is defined or determined by the relationship to the proposition. The negative side denies the proposition or disagrees with it. So we know the negative then disagrees with the affirmative side. And the negative usually also then defends the status quo the key thing is the negative rejects the proposal for change in the status quo. So here's an example. Suppose you are in favor of lowering the drinking age. The drinking age, of course, now is 21. So currently, it is illegal to use alcohol if you are under 21 years of age. So what does that tell us? The status quo, which is the current or existing law, the status quo is that it's against the law to drink if you're under 21 years of age. Now, if you wish to change the drinking age, you would be in the affirmative because you would be proposing or affirming a change in the status quo. You would advance a proposition saying, the drinking age should be lower, should be 19, should be 18. So those who wish to change the drinking age are on the affirmative side. Those who are opposed to the change, whatever that change proposal is, those who are opposed to changing the law are in the negative. Usually then this would put the negative also defending the status quo, wanting to keep the current law of, of a 21-year-old drinking age. 
Could be, however, for instance, that you would be against changing the law to 18, say, but you would be in favor of changing it to 19 or 20. So you would still be in the negative if, you, if the proposition was lower the age to 18, but you wouldn't be defending the status quo, which is 21, and that's how that works. So we always determine affirmative and negative in relation to the proposition. And so if the affirmative proposition is let's lower the drinking age to 18 and you're against that proposition, you would be in the negative. The affirmative proposition must challenge the status quo, right? So the proposition would be worded or would say something like the legal drinking age in New Hampshire should be 18. And we can clearly see then that that's a challenge to the status quo, the existing law of a uh, 21-year-old drinking age. And if you agree with that, you would be in the affirmative. If you are opposed to that proposition, you would be in the negative. So we begin public argument by identifying what we call the issue in the debate. So you've probably followed politics and you hear about politicians addressing the issues, right? What are issues? Issues are points of disagreement in a debate. So the point of issue in any public argument is the place where two sides begin to disagree. It's the point of controversy in a debate. So in a political campaign, you might have candidates addressing all kinds of different issues. There may be 20, 30, 50 issues in a campaign, but each of those issues is a point of disagreement or a point of controversy in a public debate. And it is on that point of issue that we have the exchange of reasons and evidence, which we call argumentation. So argument is always focused on a point of issue, that is a point of disagreement or a point of controversy. Now, if we can identify what a point of controversy or point of issue is, and we see that somebody is arguing and offering evidence on some other issue or some other point, or doesn't seem to be directing evidence or reasons to the point of issue, we sometimes talk about a person arguing beside the point, which is technically to say, yes, you're introducing proof, you're introducing reasons, and you're giving evidence, but all of that proof and evidence and reasoning is not addressing the key point that we disagree about, right? So we would accuse a person or we would say, you're arguing beside the point because the point of issue is the key uh, point of controversy or disagreement between two sides in a public debate. So here's an example. Let's take a look at Abraham Lincoln's fav uh, famous Cooper Union address from 1860. Now, I'll give you a little bit of context here. Lincoln um, was running for president in 1860. He was a candidate. He was the Republican nominee for president in 1860, and he was running against Stephen Douglas, who was the Democratic Party nominee for president. Previously, in 1858, Lincoln and Douglas had opposed each other in the 1858 Illinois Senate race. And it's out of that Senate race that we got the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. Now, two years later, Lincoln and Douglas are facing each other again, and this time they're running for president. Lincoln, of course, is from Illinois, but he comes east to speak in New York City at the Cooper Institute or Cooper Union, a, a higher education um, institution that still exists, by the way. And Lincoln uh, tries to emphasize the controversy uh, over the extension of slavery into the territories, which is the main issue or point of controversy, point of disagreement in the 1860 presidential election. And so he takes a quotation from Stephen Douglas that had appeared in the New York Times and crafts the issue out of that quotation. So here's what Lincoln says. He says, what is the question? which according to the text, and by the text he means 
the quotation from Douglas that was in the New York Times. He says, what is the question which according to the text, those fathers, he means the founding fathers, what is the question which according to the text, those fathers understood just as well and even better than we do now? It is this, does the proper division of local from federal authority or anything in the constitution forbid our federal government to control as to slavery in our federal territories. So he forms, first of all, this question. And he's saying, in effect, look, what does the Constitution forbid or what does it allow? Is there anything in the Constitution that forbids the federal government to control the spread of slavery in the territories? Remember, at this time, the United States wasn't covering the full North American continent yet. Uh, there was still unorganized territories and newly organized territories in the West in places like Nebraska and Kansas, for instance. Right, And so Lincoln is asking, is there anything in the Constitution which forbids the federal government, by which he means mainly Congress, is there anything in the Constitution which forbids the federal government to control that spread of slavery into the territories? Now, the key thing here is Lincoln uses the word forbid because this sets up the two sides in the debate. Notice what he says next. He says, upon this, that is upon this question, Senator Douglas holds the affirmative and Republicans the negative. This affirmation and denial form an issue. And this issue, this question, is precisely what the text declares our fathers understood better than we. Now, notice Lincoln's language here. First of all, if we go back to the first quotation, Lincoln uses the word forbid, and that places Douglas in the affirmative, meaning because Douglas says Congress does not have the power to control the spread of slavery, Lincoln words the proposition, if you will, as forbid. He says, Douglas, in other words, says there is something in the Constitution which forbids Congress, which forbids the federal government to control slavery in the federal territories. And Lincoln's position, that is the position of the Republican Party, which puts them in the negative, is that there is not anything in the Constitution that forbids Congress or forbids the federal government to control slavery in the territories. And so Lincoln is using this traditional language, this traditional vocabulary of public argumentation to craft the controversy or the issue between him and Douglas. He says, this affirmation, Douglas's side, and denial, the Republicans, the negative side, this affirmation and denial form an issue and this issue, this question, is precisely what the text declares our, father, our fathers understood better than we. Lincoln goes on in the speech then to investigate what it was that the founding fathers actually thought about congressional authority to prevent the spread of slavery. He looks very closely at the historical record, at their speeches, at their votes in early Congresses, and tries to show that none of them, none of the founding fathers, or certainly not a majority of them, thought that there was anything in the Constitution which forbid Congress or the federal government to control the spread of slavery. And that's how Lincoln forms the issue and then goes ahead and addresses it. But he's using that traditional language of public argumentation, identifying the point of issue between him and Douglas, and placing Douglas in the affirmative and the Republicans and Lincoln himself in the negative on that issue. So when we think about public argument, we want to be able to identify in each, in each case, in each argument, what is the issue and the question. Notice in Lincoln's uh, text there, he says, 
this affirmation and denial form an issue and this issue, this question. So he's identifying, recognizing the relationship of an issue to a question. So each point of controversy in a debate creates both an issue, that is a point of controversy or disagreement, and a question which opens to interrogation what had previously not been challenged. So if we go back to our original example of the official athletic colors for the university, right? It's not until someone proposes that we change from blue and white to green and gold that we have a controversy. And then each of us who had an interest in the debate would have to ask, should we change from blue and white to green and gold? So the issue goes along with the question. The issue generates a question which we then have to try to answer through the process of debate. So suppose someone had uh, makes a, a proposition or advances a proposition challenging the status quo that academic classes uh, should meet on Friday. We know they do now, that's the status quo, but suppose someone advances the proposition and says classes should not meet on Fridays, right? So that person or group who would propose that change in the status quo would be in the affirmative. Those who think we should still have classes on Friday would be in the negative. So we have one side, classes should not meet on Friday, that's the affirmative, and we have another side that says classes should meet on Friday, they would be the negative, right? But then we also have generated a question, and the question is, should classes meet on Friday? So with every issue, we get a corresponding question that we have to try to answer through the process of argumentation. So the authoritative answer to the question, the judgment is the resolution of the issue. So whether we put this to a campus vote or uh, we get an authoritative administrative ruling on it, the judgment resolves the issue. It ends, in effect, ends the controversy. If we think about uh, a political campaign, we have the two sides, the two parties, arguing their positions on the issues and ultimately we vote uh, in favor of one candidate and the majority, uh, the outcome of the election, the majority uh, uh, of the electoral college determines the resolution of that issue, who should be president of the United States. So the authoritative answer to the question resolves the issue, it answers the question. So now I want to introduce another idea here, and that is the um, notion of argumentative presumption. And presumption is what Richard Waitley, who was a 19th century rhetorician, what he called the preoccupation of the ground, which is to say, if we think about the status quo, uh, we know the existing law, we know what the current policy is, the state of things now, the way things are now, right? And going forward in the debate, the, the idea of presumption is that we presume the status quo is satisfactory until there's a good reason for changing it. We call that the benefit of presumption, and it exists in favor of the status quo. So we don't change um, the colors of the university athletic team just because somebody says, oh, I have a good idea. Let's change the colors. The presumption is that blue and white should remain the colors unless there's a really good reason for changing to green and gold or some other combination. And that presumption, uh, we call the benefit of presumption, exists in favor of the status quo. So we keep things the way they are unless there's a good reason for changing it. The negative side in debate then has the benefit of presumption. Now we can go back to the Lincoln uh, quotation and see why Lincoln chose to use the word forbid instead of the word allow. 
because had, had he asked, is there anything in the Constitution which allows Congress to control slavery, he wouldn't have been able to prove that. By saying forbid, he puts himself and the Republicans in the negative, and as a result also enjoys the benefit of presumption because he knows Douglas cannot find sufficient evidence of anything in the Constitution which forbids Congress to control slavery in the territories. So this idea of benefit of presumption exists in favor of the status quo and the negative side has that benefit of presumption because the negative is against the proposition which challenges the status quo. Now the practical op operation of presumption makes for an inherently conservative model of public argument. I don't mean conservative in terms of uh, political ideology, but in the sense that we conserve the current state of things unless we have a good reason for changing. So it, it's a model of public reasoning and public argument that, that lends itself to a kind of slow pace of change. We don't change for uh, any old reason. We don't change just because somebody says, oh, let's change. But we always are looking for some good reasons to engage in uh, change, to adopt propositions that propose changes. And because of that, we say the negative and the status quo has the benefit of presumption. So here's an example of this. Let's go to the Declaration of Independence uh, written by Thomas Jefferson and look how Jefferson understands the presumption that is at work in that public argument about whether the American colonies should be independent of the rule of King George III and Great Britain. Notice what Jefferson says in the Declaration. He says, Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. What Jefferson is doing here is he's recognizing that there is a natural presumption in favor of existing forms, in this case, existing forms of government, right? So people aren't going to overthrow their government for light and transient causes. That is, unless they have a really good reason, people are not in the habit of overthrowing their government and replacing it with new government, right? And that's what Jefferson is doing here. He's recognizing the presumption in favor of the status quo. Now, this also reveals how Jefferson understands what his position in the debate is. The American revolutionaries are proposing a change in government. They are in the affirmative. Great Britain and King George III, they are in the negative. The status quo is that Britain still rules the American colonies, right? So Jefferson's recognizing here that the presumption is in favor of Great Britain which also places on him the responsibility of giving good reasons why that presumption should be overthrown or giving good reasons why American, the American colonies should be independent. He recognizes that natural presumption in favor of existing forms. Change must be for good reasons, that is, good and sufficient reasons, not light and transient causes, as he words it in the Declaration of Independence. So this also then brings up the idea of burden of proof, because while there's a benefit of presumption that exists in favor of the status quo and is associated with the negative side in the debate, the necessity and expectation of providing reasons for a change in the status quo we call the burden of proof. And it's the affirmative side in debate that has the burden of proof. The affirmative must give good reasons for changing the status quo. 
So when somebody on the affirmative side advances a proposition, propositions always challenging the status quo, that proposition must be supported by proof that is evidence, reasons, testimony, and the like, right? There has to be good and sufficient reasons for adopting the proposition, good and sufficient reasons for changing the status quo. That's that burden of proof that goes with the affirmative. So the burden of proof requires that the affirmative provide good and sufficient reasons for adopting the proposition. And then we can advance this a little further and talk about what we call rebuttal and rejoinder. So once the affirmative side has discharged the onus probandi, which is what we, the Latin term for burden of proof, right? Once the affirmative side has uh, answered that responsibility to provide proof, then the presumption, which was in favor of the status quo, has been overthrown. And the burden now shifts to the negative. So there's been good reasons given why we should change the color to colors to green and gold. Now it's up to the blue and white advocates to defend the status quo and give reasons. But they don't need to do that until there's been good reasons for changing. But once those good reasons have been advanced, now's the time for the negative to respond. And that negative response we call the rebuttal. The negative offers a rebuttal argument aimed at answering or discrediting the affirmative case. Now, without a rebuttal, the affirmative side would carry the debate. If somebody said, oh, here's 10 good reasons to change our official university colors from blue and white to green and gold, then you've got 10 good reasons sitting out there unanswered, and it would appear that those 10 good reasons would carry the day. That's why the negative needs to offer a rebuttal, challenging that evidence, showing, and then also giving arguments in favor of uh, retaining blue and white as the official colors. But there is no need for a rebuttal until there has been an affirmative case. Okay? So the negative, again, doesn't necessarily defend the status quo, although usually that is what happens. But the rebuttal is focused on discrediting or responding to the affirmative arguments made in favor of the proposition or the proposition which is what challenges the status quo. And then after there's been a negative rebuttal, of course, the affirmative can respond again. And we call that affirmative response to the negative rebuttal a rejoinder. Following the negative rebuttal, the affirmative may advance a rejoinder aimed at restoring the strength of his or her original case. And this could go on through several rounds before time for the debate ran out or until we had to go to the polls and vote for um, a candidate or until there was a resolution somehow of the issue. But this back and forth response of reason giving, we have the original proposition, the, the affirmative case made by the affirmative side, um, discharging the burden of proof, we have then the negative side who has the benefit of presumption responding to that affirmative case with a rebuttal. And then the affirmative uh, response to the negative uh, case, which we call the rejoinder. So here's one other idea here, which we could describe as the best case scenario. Now, in a lot of ways, with the pandemic going on, we have our worst case scenario, right? But in argument, we could refer to it as best case scenario when we see an affirmative case that provides good and sufficient reasons for adopting the proposition. And we call that a prima facie case, right? That is, the affirmative has met the burden of proof. The affirmative has demonstrated the flaws which are inherent in the status quo. The affirmative has established the reasonableness of the proposition. And the affirmative has addressed all of the outstanding points of issue. So that's called a prima facie case. And then that would be the kind of case that the negative would have to respond to with a rebuttal. 
So here's a sample case. Suppose you're an animal rights activist and you abhor the practice of hunting for sport. How cruel you think, right? So you want to see the law in New Hampshire changed to forever ban this barbaric practice. Of course, we know the existing law in the state of New Hampshire allows for sport hunting. Uh, so you're challenging the status quo. You're in the affirmative. So what do you do? Well, you could start a Facebook group or you could write a letter to the governor or put an editorial in the Manchester Union Leader or you could sue the state on, on behalf of your animal friends. But if we're thinking about this in argumentative terms, let's see if we can do a little analysis uh, of the public argumentative structure of this controversy. So if you're advocating that no hunting be allowed, in this case, what is the status quo? In this case, the status quo would be the current hunting laws in New Hampshire, the current law which allows hunting for sport. That's the status quo. What might be the proposition? In this case, again, because you're in the affirmative, you need to advance a proposition, and that proposition would have to challenge the status quo, which means it would need to be something like hunting should be banned in the state of New Hampshire. Right? That would be the challenge to the status quo. Who's in the affirmative? Well, if you're proposing or affirming the change in the status quo, then you would be in the affirmative. You and everybody else who agrees that hunting should be banned would be on the affirmative side in the debate. What is the presumption? Well, again, in this case, we think about the presumption which always lies with the status quo, with the negative side. So the presumption is that the existing law which allows hunting for sport the existing law is perfectly fine until somebody shows us that it should be changed. So there's a benefit of presumption in favor of the existing law. Who has the burden of proof? As in every case, it's the affirmative side. So if you are the one advancing or affirming a proposition, if you want to change the status quo and ban hunting, then you also have the burden of proof. You're the one responsible for giving the good and sufficient reasons for changing the hunting laws in the state of New Hampshire. And then what is or what are the issue or the issues? And there might be more than one. So there might be issues related, for instance, to the morality of what you consider to be a cruel practice. There may be issues related to the management of game in the state, right? There may be issues with regard to who will um, police uh, that, that new law, right? So there may be several different points of controversy, and on each of these points of controversy or disagreement, you could have reasons given on both sides, right? But the main thing would be, the, the main point of controversy or issue would be um, the, the one that's created by your affirming that hunting should be banned and other people responding, no, we should keep the status quo and allow hunting for sport. That creates the question, should we ban hunting in New Hampshire? And we could ask who would be giving the rebuttal? Well, if you made a good case in favor of banning hunting, then the rebuttal would be the responsibility of the negative side. That is, it would, it would come from those who want to keep hunting for sport in New Hampshire. And we can switch this to, to an understanding of the same vocabulary um, in a legal situation. So we would refer to this as the legal paradigm. In other words, the legal model or the legal example of this, these same ideas related to status quo, affirmative, negative, presumption, and burden of proof. So suppose you're charged with the illegal possession of secret government computer files, right? That would be substantial 
jeopardy for you, uh, probably carrying uh, the penalties associated with espionage and the like, right? So suppose you're charged with illegal possession of secret government com computer files, and this charge of espionage carries a penalty of life in prison. So how do you plead? Now, you probably would say, well, I, I, I plead not guilty. I didn't do it, right? But it's not quite that simple. We want to understand how legal argument works in the context of the structure of public argument. So if you say you're not guilty, right, we want to know first what is the charge because the charge is like the proposition in um, a public argument, right, because the charge is what challenges the status quo. The charge challenges the status quo that you are innocent and this accusation against you is a threat to that innocence, right, and the presumption, as is the case in every legal trial, the presumption is the presumption of innocence. You are presumed innocent until you are proven guilty. So there you can see how the negative side, which is the defendant in any criminal case, the negative side has the benefit of presumption. We don't have to prove we are innocent. The affirmative side, the accuser, the prosecution, usually the government, the prosecution has the burden of proof the prosecution is the one who has to prove you are guilty. You have the benefit of presumption because you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. So as we just said, the prosecutor, the accuser, the government has the burden of proof. It's their responsibility to provide evidence, testimony, um, proof that you possessed those classified government files on your computer. Must you prove your innocence? No, you can respond to the charges in a rebuttal, so to speak, or, def or defense, right? But the presumption is always in your favor. So if the prosecution showed up and they gave a really bad case or they didn't introduce any evidence, you wouldn't have to say anything. You would have to merely exercise your presumption or, or um, retain that pr presumption of innocence and say that the case uh, hasn't been proven against you. So how do you establish reasonable doubt? As the affirmative or the prosecution introduces all the evidence, the job of the defense, the defense attorney on your behalf, would be to show all the reasons why that evidence would be doubtful or could be interpreted differently so that the jury would have um, doubt in mind, uh, wouldn't find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt because that reasonable doubt was retained through the efforts of the defense rebuttal. Okay, So what is the question for the jury? If the prosecution, if the government says you did possess those classified um, government files and you said you did not, there's the controversy, the point of disagreement. So the question for the jury would be, did he or she possess those government files, those classified government documents on the computer? Okay. So we can go a little further and we can talk about what we call stasis or the legal points of issue that are possible in any kind of criminal trial. So the first of these would be the issue of fact or the point of conjecture. Um, and here we would be arguing about whether or not you did the act that is alleged, okay? You had the secret files in your possession, says the prosecution, right? And you would respond and say, I did not have the secret files in my possession. And then the question for the jury would be, did she have the files in her possession? Okay? So that would be the point of issue where it's simply a matter of fact, um, the question of fact, simply a matter of fact, did you or did you not have those files in your possession? But that's not the only issue that's possible in a legal trial. We could also talk about the issue of definition. So we, we might not argue about whether you had those files on your computer, 
but we might argue that those files should be defined in a different way. Maybe they aren't classified documents, or maybe they were there accidentally, not as a result of espionage, right? So you might admit that you had the files, and therefore you committed espionage. I admit I had the files, but I was unaware of their existence on my new laptop hard drive, right? It was not espionage, but rather a technical error. So here, the two sides would be debating on the point of issue. The, def, um, the, the prosecution or the state, the government, saying you admit you had the files, therefore you committed espionage. So they would define that possession as espionage. But you would respond and say, I admit I had the files, but I was unaware of their existence on my new laptop. It was not espionage, but rather technical error. So notice here, the controversy is not on the question of fact, did you have the files, but it's a question of definition. What should we call the possession on your computer of those files? Was it, as the government says, es espionage, or was it merely a technical error? Maybe it was left over from uh, a, on a hard drive file um, that was placed in your new uh, computer. It wasn't your, something you did, but rather a, a, a technical um, error. So the jury would have to decide. So here's the question that's generated by the issue. Does the possession of these files on the computer constitute espionage or something else, right? So they would, the question they would answer would be a question on the issue of definition. And then there's a third issue, and we call this the issue of quality. What is the quality or nature of the act in question? This is a way of thinking about not whether the act was done, nor even what we should call the act, but whether or not in some way we could excuse or justify or explain uh, or account for um, or, or mitigate the severity of the charge, right? So you admit you were spying. That is a grave and inexcusable offense against the nation, says the prosecution, right? So this would be their position on the issue of quality. You had the computer files, you admit it was espionage, and so you're guilty of this grave offense. But you would say, I do admit to spying. I did have the files on my computer, question of fact, and I understand then that that's espionage, question of definition, but those aren't the points of issue here, right? You would say, I admit to spying, but in the service of a higher cause, for my nation's leader was conspiring in a military plot to end constitutional law, and my aim was only to expose this danger to liberty. So you would acknowledge the fact, and you would admit the definition, but you would argue now that this was justified in this case, that is, there were circumstances that justified this violation of the law, because of the greater importance of preventing the overthrow of constitutional government uh, in America. Perhaps one of the classic cases of an, of an argument of this sort uh, would be the Rosa Parks case. You probably know about Rosa Parks who refused to give up her seat at the front of the bus, right? There wasn't any question about whether she did in fact refuse to give up her seat. She deliberately did not, right? So she acknowledges the action or the question of fact. And we all know that under the, the city laws of Montgomery, Alabama in 1955, that refusal by a black person to give up their seat was against the law. And she knew that as well as everybody else, right? So there wasn't an issue of did she do it or not. And there wasn't an issue of whether that was against the law or not. But she refused to give up her seat because she was answering to a higher law. That is, she was trying to make a point about the injustice of the segregation laws in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. 
and most of us would agree that that in in violating that law she was right to be answering to that higher law that would be an argument or a point on the issue of quality okay so the question is was this illegal action in some way justifiable or excusable or was the seriousness of it mitigated in some way suppose you're um, caught speeding on uh, I-93 um, driving your pickup truck going 95 miles an hour and the state trooper pulls you over and you say uh, I'm sorry officer but my wife is in labor and I'm rushing her to the hospital so there wouldn't be any question about whether you were going 95 there wouldn't be a debate about whether that was over the speed limit or against the law but you would point to the circumstances to justify or excuse your violation of the law and that would be the point of quality okay. and then finally there is what we call the issue of jurisdiction and procedure or what the Romans called the translative issue where the point of controversy would not be about the facts in the case or about how to define the act or whether or not it was justifiable but they would be related to the procedures used in bringing the charges or they would be related to the venue or court where the charges were being heard okay so maybe the government will say you will be tried by a military tribunal and you say no I'm a civilian I need to be tried by a civilian jury of my peers so that would be a dispute or a controversy on jurisdiction where should the case be heard right uh, or the government might say your friends have been tortured and given testimony against you and you might respond and say torture is illegal so the testimony is inadmissible right or you could say the government files were found by an illegal search of my computer so those would be matters of controversy related to procedure so these questions on jurisdiction or procedure we call the translative issue and that's the last of the four points of legal stasis or legal issues um, in matters of forensic or legal controversy in our court system. <clears throat> so finally, let's talk a little bit about different types of propositions and claims. Okay. So we talk about propositions and propositions starting arguments and propositions challenging the status quo right so a proposition must be a claim but not all claims are propositions because there can be several sub claims in the course of an argument so just keep this idea of proposition and claim in mind so a proposition is the central or instigating claim in a debate which is to say it's the thing that gets the debate going it starts the controversy so when you say um, we should change the colors of the university to green and gold that would be the instigating claim it would start the debate and that would be the main proposition about which ultimately would we would have to make a judgment but you might make several sub claims in the course of that debate you might claim that green and gold is cheaper to manufacture as a uniform color than blue and white right so that would be a sub claim which would support the proposition or the central or instigating claim in the debate so proposition is what defines the terms of the debate and any debate may have any number or a series of claims and sub claims in support uh, of the proposition each one of those issues or claims could be di disputed so each one could be an, um, an, an issue that would have to be argued a claim is any statement that creates an issue okay so any statement that advances um, a truth a truth claim that someone else could disagree with uh, and which invites the introduction of evidence 
reason, proof, and argument, that would be um, a, a claim. And so uh, um, any public controversy, any public debate may have any number of claims and subclaims all gathered or arranged underneath the central or instigating claim of the proposition. So a claim must be a statement or an implied statement. And what is a statement? A statement is simply a sentence or a part of a sentence that can be true or false. And so when you advance a claim, you are essentially making a truth claim, right? But you also recognize there are people who will not agree with that statement, right? And so the claim creates a controversy or an issue. If you make a statement and you know there are some people who will disagree with it, then that would be a claim because it's a matter of controversy and it would also then create the need for reasons and argument. So claim is advanced publicly. You can think about claims in your mind, but until you advance it in writing or speaking, it isn't going to be a matter of public controversy. So we would say a claim has to be advanced publicly. And a claim creates both an issue and a question. So if I say um, green and gold should be the colors of the University of New Hampshire, right? that creates an issue because I know there's going to be people who disagree with it once I've asserted that publicly. And that then will create not only the controversy or the issue, but the question that everyone has to answer, which is the better colors for the University of New Hampshire. Claims, however, cannot stand on their own. Because they are controversial, they carry with them the responsibility, the burden of proof, right? Uh, they need evidence. They need proof and reason in support of the claim. Somebody can't just say, well, I think we should change to green and gold, and that's the end of it, right? We expect them, if they say such a thing, to offer reasons in support of such a claim. So claims must be supported by evidence. So what are the different types of claims? Okay, different types of claims. First of all, we can have factual claims, right? A claim about what is true or false. These could be historical, such as did something happen, right? Um, they could be causal. Does one thing affect another? Or they could be predictive. Will something occur? Okay, so we can think about this in, in the context of the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, right? We could say as a historical claim, did the virus originate in the wet market at Wuhan, China, right? That would be a historical claim, right? Uh, we could say, what's the causal claim, okay? Does the virus lead to uh, pneumonia, right? That would be, does one thing affect another? And a predictive claim. Um, if we open up society, if we open up the university too soon without careful measures to uh, mitigate the spread, uh, will there be a spike in infections, right? That's a predictive question. Or we would say there will be a spike that would be a predictive claim, okay? So all of these would be variations of factual claims. Then there are value claims. Value claims advance an opinion or an interpretive judgment about what is good or better or right or just or beautiful or sinful or effective, legal, horrible, ethical, justifiable, worse, etc. Anytime you make a value judgment about something, right? Ted Williams was the best Red Sox player of all time, right? That's a value claim. Um, we could say, um, uh, anytime we say, um, uh, Durham House of Pizza pizza is better than Wildcat Pizza pizza, okay? Um, that would be a value judgment. We're advancing a value claim. It's your opinion, but your opinion can be a claim, and it can be an opinion or a judgment, a value judgment, that can be supported by reasons. 
you could talk about even the, the great pizza controversy, you could say, well, the dough is better. They use a better quality of sauce. Their ingredients are fresher. These would all be reasons in support of your value judgment about one pizza being better than another. And then we have policy claims. And policy claims are claims about a collective or community action that should be taken to promote the public good. So if we're thinking about, you know, we need another stimulus package or we need to change the drinking age law or we need to change the colors of the university from blue and white to green and gold, these would all be policy claims because they would be claims about what we should do going forward. Now, in the course of the semester, you're going to actually write, um, do writing assignments focused on each of these kinds of claims factual claim, value claim, and policy claim. But here I'll introduce them just as ways of thinking about the kinds of claims that you can make in public argument. So put yourself to the test a little bit here and consider each of the following claims and tell me what kind of claim each is. So here's the first one. Hawthorne wrote Pride and Prejudice. Right? If you think about that, right, it's either true or not true. Did Nathaniel Hawthorne write Pride and Prejudice or not, right? That's a factual claim. In this case, it happens to be false, right? Jane Austen wrote Pride and Prejudice. Nathaniel Hawthorne did not, though he wrote many great books like um, The Scarlet Letter and The House of Seven Gables and the like, right? But this claim would be false, but it would still be a claim because we, if somebody advanced this, let's say, in an English paper, right, um, it, would be a, it would be a claim that would have to have evidence in support of it. People obviously uh, would disagree with it if they knew American literary history, right? And so maybe you believe there was actually a, uh, um, a secret agreement between Nathaniel Hawthorne and and Jane Austen, and, and he was this, the ghost writer for her novels or something. Right? It's possible that that happened, but a very unlikely. All the same, you could say this would be a factual claim. In this case, a historical claim, uh, the variety of factual. Dorothy killed the Wicked Witch of the West. Now, if you think about that, you're saying, well, yeah, in The Wizard of Oz, that's what happens. Except it happens only in the context of The Wizard of Oz. So it's not true or false in relation to anything in the real world because claims have to be statements about things in the real world. So the only way this functions as a claim, and it would be a factual claim if it was a claim, the only way this functions as a claim is if we put it in the fictional context of Wizard of Oz. So if we say, in the movie or in the, in the novel, The Wizard of Oz, or in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, the character Dorothy kills the Wicked Witch of the West, right? throwing a bucket of water on, I'm melting, I'm melting. Right? But that's only true in the fictional context of the novel or the movie. Right? There is no real Dorothy in the real world who kills a real wicked of witch, wicked witch of the West. So, because a claim must make a, it must make, advance a truth about something in the real world, we wouldn't even count this as a claim, except if we put it in the proper fictional context. How about this? Had you heard that J. D. Salinger died? Now notice. This is a question, right? So it doesn't make a statement because a statement advances a claim, right? But this is a question, and a question is not a statement because a question cannot be true or false. A statement, a claim has to be a statement, and a statement is a sentence or a part of a sentence that can be true or false. And a question is neither true nor false. The answer to the question can be true or false, but the question itself is neither. But also in this case, we notice that the question implies a statement. The question implies the truth that in fact J.D. Salinger 
is dead, right? And so that part, we would say, is true. And so this would be a claim that J.D. Salinger died. But the question itself is not a claim. It's only implied within the question. So we're looking at the part of the question, the sentence that's the question, that functions as a statement, and that is J.D. Salinger died. Charlemagne was crowned emperor in 800 AD. Now, unless you're a medieval historian, you may not know this, right? But you could recognize this is a historical claim. Turns out it's true, but you may not know whether it's true or false. There may be some historians who would dispute this or debate it. It could be controversial, so it could function as a claim. Insofar as it is a claim, it would be a factual claim of the historical variety. The Red Sox will win the American League pennant this year. That, of course, assumes that there will be any baseball at all, right? But this is a predictive claim. Again, it's factual, but here we don't know what the outcome of the baseball season is going to be. We don't know what things will look like in uh, October or maybe even November when they still might be playing the World Series. Um, but in any case, this is predictive, and so it's, predict it's a predictive claim. We don't know for certain, and we won't know for certain whether it's true or false till much later, but we could still make the claim uh, now, and it would be a factual claim of the predictive variety. He lost half his retirement in the stock market crash, right? So we know the... Uh, when the pandemic hit, the, the stock market tumbled. Uh, I didn't lose quite half my retirement, but I lost a significant amount, right? But if you said that again, that would be a factual claim. Uh, in this case, it would be a historical claim because it refers to something that happened in the recent past. High stress leads to insomnia in teenagers, right? So here again, it's a factual claim but it's of the causal variety. Stress leads to insomnia. That's the causal link here that we're focused on. Again, you could see how if this was, say, a claim made in a medical journal, how there would be scientific evidence um, to support that claim. The government of Israel plotted the 9-11 attack, right? Every once in a while you get a conspiracy theory. This is one that I've seen circulating. It's been circulating for 20 years, right? Um, the government Israel plotted the 9-11 attack. There may not be good evidence in support of it, but it still functions as a claim. And those who advance a proposition like this try to generate or manufacture the evidence in support of it. It certainly would be a controversial claim. Uh, very unlikely to be true, but it would still be a uh, historical claim uh, focused on the attack of 9-11. The subway crash was caused by a texting driver. Again, another factual claim of the causal variety. You even have the word caused there in the claim. Maybe that was some other mechanical problem, right? So there, there, this could be additional reasons or a different reason why there was a crash, right? But here the claim is made that it was because of a texting driver. The polar ice caps will melt before the 21st century is over. Here again, a predictive claim. So all of these claims here uh, are um, factual claims, some historical some causal, and some predictive. So we'd all categorize all of these as factual claims. Now here's some others. UNH should charge less for J-term classes. Notice the word should, right? That gives you a clue. This is a recommendation about a policy. It's a policy claim. It would be a proposition which would challenge the status quo, which we would expect the person who would, who's affirming or advancing that proposition to give reasons why J-term classes should cost less. The Beatles at Shea Stadium was the best live concert of the 60s. Yeah. Notice the word best. That tells you it's a value judgment. There are certainly other live concerts in the 60s, but a person advancing this statement would be making a value claim about which of those would be the best, right? So that's a value claim. 
Cloning of human beings is always wrong. Here again, focus on the word wrong, which is a value judgment. It's another value claim. Um, it doesn't say uh, can be done or, or can't be done, right? Um, that would be a factual claim. But here it makes a value judgment about the possibility of cloning, cloning human beings, right? And that value judgment or value claim is what's being advanced. The rainy weather kept everyone away from her cookout. That, of course, and social distancing. So the rainy weather kept everyone away. That's a causal claim. It says this is the reason why this other thing happened. So this would be factual, but also causal. He died from the disease, not from the injury he received in the accident. Right. So here again, it would be a causal claim focused on the cause of the person's death. It wasn't the accident, it was the disease. Calculus would be worse than Latin as an elective course. Now, there might be implied here a policy recommendation about which course you could take or should take, but also notice that the emphasis is on the value judgment, what is worse, okay? So this is a value claim. The U.S. should nuke North Korea. I hope this doesn't happen, but if someone made that proposal, it would be a policy claim. Notice the word should again. The U.S. should nuke North Korea. That's recommending an action. Adultery is justifiable in cases of spousal abandonment. Right? Justifiable is a value judgment. That's a value claim. There is no life on other planets. We may never know this, right? Right now, we don't have any proof or evidence of that, though we could speculate and do statistical progressions and that kind of thing, right? Um, analyzing the likelihood of this being true or false. But it is a statement. It could be true. It could be false. We may never know whether it's true or false, but it's a factual claim, right? Um, and we would have to gather evidence in support or against this, depending on what we believe. But it's still a factual claim. There either is or there is not. It's true or false that there is life on other planets. The general's failure to protect his troops was inexcusable. Okay. Here, again, a value judgment being made, a judgment about uh, the, the um, competence of the general. And that's a value claim. So that's it for our first uh, long lesson on uh, public argument. And uh, we'll be on to more argumentation in the next lecture.